And we're live. Welcome everybody here to the Lakers Lounge. I'm Anthony Irwin of Lakers Daily, joined by Sabrina Merchant of The Athletic. There is both of the places that we are from. Um, today on the show, we are going to be talking about uh, Darvin Ham, and, and we are going to be talking about the season that the Lakers uh, have had to this point. There's only a, a couple games or a few games left of this season. We're also obviously going to be talking about that women's tournament and the insane numbers that the final did. Um, and um, we're, you know, we're just going to kind of wander around all of those subjects. But first, I have a very important question for you, Sabrina. I have the Masters on in the background. I always, okay. this is like one of my favorite times of the year. It is peak dad nap season. Sure. Um, are you are you a fan of the Masters? Like, do you do you is do you ever check in on this thing? My my relationship with the Masters is I watch Chris Harrington do his little bit once a year, and that's about it. <laughs> <laughs> I I can't get enough of it. Like it's just all of this, you know, all of these kind of pudgy little white dudes that are just putting around and 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 doing incredible. Now I do play golf, so I do recognize like the stuff that they do is actually mm -hmm. insane. Sure, but um. Yeah, it's it's probably the widest thing that I do. I just I get I fall <laughs> fully in love with so this is with why this I'm on today instead of Aaron this week. I get that. <laughs> He's I don't tomorrow, challenge gonna, you on your white people stuff. <laughs> I'm gonna ask him if he gets into it because I know the answer. Um, no, uh today though, like I said, we're gonna be talking about um this season. We're gonna be talking about Darvin Ham, and we're going to be starting with I I accidentally left the uh, background on from yesterday's show, last night's show um, on when Sabrina hopped on here and she said she didn't have any thoughts on uh, on this pick situation, the pick swap situation. So I asked you, Sabrina, what do you think is, you know, about the Pelicans choice? Because I do think it's a tough one. You said it isn't a tough one. Um, and, and I want to know why. Why is this an, an easy decision that the Pelicans can make here? I mean, the way I see it is obviously I'm not nearly as plugged in to the reporting as you are. And full disclosure, I haven't watched a full Laker game in about three weeks because, you know, my job so nice. uh, demanded so some jealous. other <laughs> some <laughs> other things from me. But I actually assume... I'm not jealous. This was the best stretch of basketball they played. <laughs> I kept thinking that as I would like, you know, just check into the scores and get my regular texts from Raj. And then the, the <laughs> mood just soured so quickly after these last two games against yeah. Minnesota and the Warriors. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I, my assumption is that uh, Rob Polinka does not have the stones to fire Darvin Ham after two seasons, one of which included a berth in the Western Conference finals. So I would assume Darvin Ham comes back and, uh, the majority of his body of work suggests that he's not a very good coach. And thus I expect the Lakers to be worse than they were this year, which means uh, the Western conference will also be better. So I think the pick will be better and the draft is also supposed to be better. So it seems like a pretty easy decision for me if I'm the Pelicans to defer till 2025. So you think he would, he wouldn't fire him because he has stones. Or, or because he, no, doesn't he does have not have the stones. stones to fire Darvin. Cause I feel like bringing him back takes more fortitude. I think inertia always area. requires the least amount of fortitude. Cause like my thing is, all right. Yeah. You do have to ask your boss for actually a lot of money, probably, uh, you know, because you know, depending on who you're hiring, I'm assuming it is probably going Darvin's to on a three-year deal and you're only eating one year of money, but still you are eating four, some money. It's it was a four, four year. Okay. He, is it like four with you, a team option or mm -mm, it's Cause usually these first, be, first coach contracts are like four years with a team option in year four. Yeah, I'm I'm pretty sure it's just a straight four years. Okay. Um, and the reason that I remember that is because of the hullabaloo that was made over uh Frank Vogel's contract situation and and how they were like, Okay, watch us, we're gonna give a worse coach a oh, longer man. contract. My dear Frank, uh, already on the hot seat in Phoenix from yeah, what I'm reading. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, all right, well, but yeah, I I I actually so you're right in the sense that you know, firing him would require acknowledging that you hired the wrong person in the first place, because it was only two years after the fact, if you hire somebody that at, to that type of position and then fire that person two years later, that's an acknowledgement. That's a whoopsie do, right? That mm -hmm. is, that is going to genie bus and saying my bad. And, that's on uh, me. We do not have a, a history of Rob Polinka admitting whoopsie do. So yeah, it's just true. Yeah. very, very true. 
Um, you are, uh, you are, you know, and even further to this point, you're basically going to uh, Genie Bus, and you're saying, um, by the way, not only are you going to be on the hook for the remaining eight million dollars of Darvin Ham's contract, but also, I don't know if you've noticed what coaching contracts have done in the last few years. Do you oh mind God. signing one of those ones? <laughs> I totally um, forgot about that. That's an excellent point. My goodness, has there been coaching contract inflation? I think Jeannie would just rather sell. <laughs> I think she would, just, <laughs> she would just be like, I'm good. I don't want to do this anymore. Um, but yeah, I. all that said, I do think, though, that like if he doesn't fire Darvin Ham, I don't know what, like, I don't know how lebron handles that right are you willing to risk your relationship <laughs> with 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 lebron i don't know if he would retire i think he clearly has t a ton left in the tank right oh he, he has the player option this year right 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 yeah. yeah so i you know i don't think he would i i think he would probably pick up the option and then like kind of quietly hey <laughs> rob genie <laughs> I, I think we're done here um but like it, you know, I, I I don't know if if Rob is willing to risk that with LeBron, and also with the fans. Like I don't know how the Lakers possibly go into next season and tell their fans. Like, do they is the first tweet of the season the thank you fans image? Like, is it is it just? Like I mean, my my response to the fans thing is: Have we noticed any decline in attendance or merchandise sales or anything like that? Like, I don't think the business is suffering, is it? Yeah. Well, I don't know if the business is suffering, but I think belief in the in the organization is definitely suffering. You know, like yeah, but unless the fact that you you've can had measure that Anthony Davis and LeBron and you know been mediocre, like you know, I I, I don't. <laughs> I, it was well, crazy because um, you know normally I'll, I fire off the occasional tweet here and there, and and I obviously probably lean more pessimistic about this organization than most, and certainly among people covering this team. And um, the amount of pushback I'm not getting, and actually, like the the nudging that I'm getting from fans, like you know, from Lakers fans, like, hey, go further, let's keep yeah. it going, <laughs> let's keep this pressure going. It's crazy. It's at like I remember when I first started in this. Um, and and hell, when um when the Lakers hired Magic Johnson in the first place, I said, I don't know if this is the best move, right? I don't, I don't like if you look at Magic Johnson's track record of things that he can't just throw money at, I don't think he has a very good one, right? Um, was a terrible coach of the Lakers. His like um ha like late night show was is like Oh, celebrated <laughs> he's like celebrated as one of the worst things to ever hit tv screens ever um and and he tends to quit on stuff when it when it isn't when it isn't going very well right his his comeback to the lakers uh you know didn't go as as he thought it was going to go and he was just like ah, i'm done he was coaching careers like yeah this kind of sucks too i don't want to do this either um, and, and when I said that, right, I had all kinds of, of, uh, pushback to, to those things. And when I said, I, if you're going to hire magic, then you should probably hire somebody with more experience than Rob Palenka. Right. And no, it was like, well, he's an extension of Kobe. We have to, we have to maintain that connection to Kobe. Right. And, and, um, and you know, there was pushback there. I got uh pushback for not liking the Russell Westbrook trade. Right. Saying like, I don't love the fact that this guy's making the the GDP of some small countries, right? And and can't shoot and has never shown any interest to learn how to shoot, um, nor play off of the ball. And I got pushed back for for you know not liking that one. Now it's like no man, <laughs> keep it going. I could <laughs> I have reported all kinds of insane things, and rather yep. than like wonder if if like some of these things are actually true, it's like. Hey, do you have any more? Like people are like, like, like my message, my mentions are just a whole bunch of people scratching their neck. Like, Hey, do you have any, is there any more? Like, is there any more dirt that you could possibly pile? People are believing Sam Amico now when he says that uh, players are hating the, um, the, the, the way that Darvin Ham has coached this team. Um, and, and I just like, when you, when you combine all of those things, I do think Jeannie, she sits there in the, in the crowd every night 
You know, she doesn't have a, an owner's box, right? She sits in the crowd. She mm -hmm. hears all of this noise. Um, Rob Polinka, you know, uh, will, will, you know, I, he just traveled with the team. He heard, he, he'll hear some of the frustration from fans as well. You always know that there's frustration that he is hearing because he won't do any interviews um, while things aren't going very well. And I think with, with this team and this organization listening in the way that they do, I just can't, I can't fathom them bringing Darwin back. I can't even given all of the, the financial constraints. I just, I can't possibly see it. Yeah. It's too bad. We didn't create this kind of uproar when Alex Caruso was a free agent. See if oh, I, I tried. <laughs> <laughs> but, literally, and I got literally pushed just back a matter of money literally just a matter of money no roster spot no nothing like that just uh do you want to pay him or not yeah well and and that was another one right where I said that was too well that was one that like everybody covering the team was united in saying this was stupid That's right stupid. there were only there were only the occasional like if I if I remember correctly I think it was only the Kamenetsky brothers who were like and it wasn't even that they were saying it was a wise decision they were like Money is money, you know, and this is the constraints that the Lakers are operating under. And um, and again, like I, I again, I'm not saying that they were like sitting there. And I if I had Andy or Brian in front of me right now, I'm, I don't think they would sit here and say like, yeah, it was smart to let Alex Caruso walk. It was everybody said it was dumb. Mm -hmm. um, but even there, like fans kind of supported it. Right. They had just brought in Russell Westbrook. And the thinking there was that like you don't necessarily need Caruso when you have such a commitment to uh, Russell Westbrook in the backcourt. Uh, maybe THT is showing enough that like he can make up for what you're, <laughs> what you're losing in Caruso. And all of those things proved to be wrong, right? But fans at least then were like, well, you know, let's see how this plays out. I don't think they would get like any semblance of benefit of the doubt if Darwin is back. Like you can't go from the Western Conference Finals, have a better roster, have a healthy LeBron James and a healthy Anthony Davis for more games than they have ever played together and be the 10 seed, yep. you know, and, and lose, probably lose like, like the history of these teams, the 10 seed winning both of those road games to make it into the playoffs is not great. Now there isn't it's a zero. ton of in yeah, <laughs> well, there it's a small sample size because sure, this thing but it has never happened. <laughs> it, it has never happened, and um, if that is how this ends, I you know one, I don't see how Darwin can possibly be back. But but two, if that is how this ends, like how are you going to look back on the season? Um, that face is perfect. A, yeah, the face that you just made right there is like yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, sometimes sometimes pictures are better at this job than words are. Uh, yeah, just a colossal disappointment um, and just a huge, huge bummer after how good things were around the in-season tournament time. Um, like I I was out watching the final with, you know, some of my friends around here in L.A. And we were like joking, like, you know, meet back here in June because we looked so good at that time. Yeah. And uh, presumably that's not going to happen now. I don't have to, you know hold any dates for that but yeah i mean you you said it right like this is a it's a roster like and no, nothing has gone as it was supposed to from the start of the season right like the the theme of the off season was we're going to lean into our continuity like you watch denver they knew exactly how to play with one another we have only played with one another for 30 some odd games let's let's build together and then uh, the lakers did not build together and benched three of their pieces who were core members of that playoff run I mean, you can debate how core of a member D'Angelo Russell was because his playoff performance was very mixed, but they benched Austin Reeves and Rui Hachimura intermittently, you know, when they were such key pieces of that playoff run. Yeah. Uh, they clearly, you know, disengaged Austin Reeves, disengaged D'Angelo Russell, uh, did not lean into continuity whatsoever, wasted a healthy season of LeBron and Anthony Davis, and somehow created bad vibes when they were even playing well, which I still am very uncertain how that happened. But... Yeah, it's a, it's a colossal disappointment. I think even a nine seed is a colossal disappointment. Whether they make the playoffs or not, like I think we're closer to Denver being the one seed after that win over Minnesota last night. Yep. So if you're in that 9-10, your best case scenario is a first round date with the Nuggets. Like, all right, great. That's that. <laughs> 
I've had people say like, you know what? We'd rather see the Nuggets now while we aren't tired and while we're healthy. It's like Vanderbilt isn't playing. Like, no, no. If you I'd play rather them somebody right else away, have a chance to take out the Nuggets. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, Minnesota like, plays them pretty well, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I had that conversation. I forget who I was. I think it was with my dad. And he was saying like, Oh, you don't want to be the team that knocks out the Nuggets? Like, no, yeah, I have no desire to do that. Yeah. I don't care at all. I want, like, like the Lakers don't hang banners for knocking out great teams. They, they hang banners for winning championships. Yep, yep. Like for me, your best chance of winning a championship is avoiding that team. Like yeah, I remember in 2000 when the Lakers won and it was like, Oh, they didn't have to face the Spurs because Tim Duncan got hurt and the, you know, the Spurs had won the year before. And it's like, Beat the four teams in front of them. Don't really care. <laughs> it also helps that the Lakers beat the Spurs the next two years. The next two right? years, very so, convincingly. Yes, yes. It, so it was like, but it was you know, a topic it, of discussion back in two thousand. Oh, for sure was. I I, I remember, especially because it was yeah. like you know, Kobe and Duncan were kind of rising together, right? And there was this, and, and obviously Shaq was at the peak of his powers. Mm -hmm. So like that's why the Lakers, whenever they played the Spurs in the series, other than. Like the whole Kobe era, right? The Spurs never beat them in a series, if I remember. They did. Uh, they beat him in no, 2003. The final year, right? They beat the him in, uh, I want to say they beat him in 99. Yeah. Uh, 99, 2003. They beat him again in uh, 2013, right? That was obviously different. That was the. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah. Yeah, I, but yeah, I, I just, I just assume just if you have to play Denver, right? If you see them in the Western Conference Finals, okay, right? fine mm -hmm. like they are unavoidable they are they are inevitable right you watch them play and it's a close game and it's just you know exactly how that game is probably going to go um almost regardless of who they're playing and and so if they are a team that you have to face then okay but i, I if i don't have to if <laughs> if i have the choice to be made i would I'll rather not um hell i i'd almost rather lose in the playing games than like play the, the, the nuggets again i don't oh i don't, I, like I don't feel that, that way i don't feel that way. i don't i don't like seeing that fan base happy i don't like you know i love adam i love all the guys at dnvr i don't want to see any of you happy at the, because of my lakers <laughs> like i'm good <laughs> yeah i would um i would rather beat the warriors in the play in than uh not beat the warriors in the play in that is a fan base that annoys me far more than the nuggets do so yeah um yeah i i like the, the 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 idea of looking back on the season you know if it does end in the next week or so is complicated right because uh there are some explanations not excuses explanations for some of the thought process here that the processes that that that, that went in on here right uh torian prince began the year as the starting small forward because he was the closest thing to a small forward that the Lakers kind of had, right? Um, Rui is is more of a like power forward than small forward. Um, his foot speed is still kind of an issue when when the Lakers are out there. It's kind of why the the, the Lakers defense is as bad as it's been. Um, and you know, you, you maybe you say like, all right, you want to try somebody with a little bit more foot speed out there. Okay. Um, Cam Reddish started the year playing really, really well while Austin and D'Lo looked like they couldn't figure out how to play uh, together, right? You say like, okay, you, it, it's kind of tricky, but okay. Like you want to, you want to give that team a different look while, while things were not going great at the beginning of the year, but sticking with those things for as long <laughs> as they did is the problem here. And and that's where, you know, I'm I'm always going to look at this season as a missed opportunity because, again, LeBron James, like, you could make the argument, this is the greatest late-stage season that we will ever see from an athlete. 35-plus, for sure, yeah. <laughs> like, like, maybe you could, like, I guess Tom Brady won a Super Bowl late. Like, it... it, it, it he had a lot to work with. You know, he's like 30. Yeah. Well, he's pretty, his, old. His he's pretty old. Final Super Bowl, I think he was like 37 or 38. I want right? to say he was even in his 40s, but I could be wrong. He could be. It's not quite fair because like football. Like you're saying, yeah. He didn't have to. He didn't have to play defense. Right. He doesn't have to play defense in that sport. And like you said, that that Bucks team was loaded when when he got there, uh, you know, offensively and defensively. Um, 
you know, oh, yeah, they he, just... was, he was well into his 40s. <laughs> yeah. Really? He's 43. Yeah. Oh, my God. All right. So it's between this season and that season for yeah. like the, the best, like late, late stage, uh, you know, type of season. But like you're still talking about it. in the history of the sports, those two seasons being alongside each other for the great and the Lakers just like the Buccaneers turned that into a Super Bowl. The Lakers turned that into a fart noise, right? It's yep. just, it, you know, it just feels like a big, and especially when you consider Anthony Davis probably played, played some of his best basketball as a Laker over the course of this season, you know, um, he, he like refound his jump shot to a, a decent extent, uh, obviously still very special defensively and was just putting together some stat lines that were just insane when you consider stocks as a part of that stat line. And, and so you have these two guys playing the way that they did. And I know Darvin Ham would sit up there and tell you that it's uh, harder to miss role players than big dogs, as he said it. But that's just not true. Like, it's just it's, not. <laughs> it's just not true. And 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 I'm going to look, you know, if the season does end here in the next like in the next week or so, I'm going to look back on it and be like, yeah, this one got away. Mm-hmm. You know, th- like this one. This one got away, and 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 the person, frankly, at fault for it getting out of way, it, uh, uh, you know, uh, getting away from us, uh, that person can't remain employed. You know, like it just so much went wrong that can be traced back to this singular person that I just don't see a scenario here where it makes any sense whatsoever from a basketball standpoint to bring the guy back. And uh, I don't know how they would – I don't even think they would – I don't think they have – the ability to try to explain that decision. You know, they're just like, oh, he's back. <laughs> yeah, costs a lot of money to hire a new coach. I'm not sure you're aware. <laughs> How much would it hurt if the Clippers fall on their face again? Because they are going to. Ty Lue's there potentially again. And the Lakers trot out Darvin Ham next year. <laughs> oh, man. I mean, Ty Lue would also be expensive, I would imagine, although yeah. maybe you could get a discount after he flames out on the other side. But, yeah, I mean, I don't I don't really think it matters who is available. Like, even if Ty Lue, like goes and wins a championship with the Clippers and is still employed by them, it doesn't really matter like who is on the market. Anybody would be preferable to Tarvin Ham. <laughs> like, call Becky Hammond. She's available. Like, see if she wants to come over. I'm sure you could probably get a discount there just because it'd be her first NBA job. Um, they're, they're just, they're, there is a better option. I'm not, she's not available, but like they would not oh, stop her from yeah. leaving okay. for the NBA is the, did I miss something? But, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, there, there are just an innumerable number of options who would be preferable to Darvin Ham and to go into a season with LeBron James and Darvin Ham. Like if this was a rebuild year, if LeBron decided he was retiring, if they like traded away <laughs> Anthony Davis for spare parts or whatever, like. That's the only way you could justify bringing in a bad coach because maybe he has some player development chops. I don't actually know if he does because I don't think we've seen him in that situation. But no, there's, like you said, there's there's really no excuse, and yet I still expect it to happen. Don Staley would be fun. I just had a comment here in the in the comment section. That would be, I mean, like, what else does she have to accomplish in her in in college basketball? Right? Like, it's. I mean, win back to back. That'd be fun. You know, uh, I don't think you're a dynasty until you win back to back. That's true. So, but like do undefeated that. with a brand new starting five. Like, sure. sure. That's, that's pretty insane. good. <laughs> that's, <laughs> it's like there was all obviously we'll talk about the women's tournament here in a little bit, but like uh there was a lot of focus on Caitlin Clark and and I, I feel like that detail wasn't brought up nearly enough. It's like, it's a pretty know. big detail, yeah. <laughs> it's like, this wasn't mm-hmm. like you know, bringing back the whole last year's team and, and, and it's not like the nuggets riding with their continuity, right? No, it's nothing like that. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) They, they they had as much continuity as Darvin Ham seems to have preferred. Um, yeah, I, I, I think that if, if Darvin is back, the Lakers would legitimately be, uh, pissing off LeBron to an extent that he would not come back. And um, that's speculation on my part, to be absolutely clear. Mm-hmm. Um, I think, you know, he's certainly leaning right now based on reports and based on what you hear in some of these circles. 
he's certainly leaning towards coming back to the Lakers next year. But you look at like you look at his face that he had. Uh, you know, I don't know. Did you watch this last game against the Warriors? Um, there was like there was plenty of of the, as there always is. They they showed him on the sideline as the game is coming to a close, and he again has that like million mile stare that is just like I can't, I can't believe this happened again. You know, and um, and I I do genuinely believe that uh. You know, if if the Lakers do do opt, because this is what's funny. The report that I had earlier this year about uh, it's not necessarily like the the act of ignoring the play that a coach draws up. Superstars throughout the history of the NBA have done that, right? That's always been a thing. But the fact that he would like, you know, I had somebody tell me that he rolls his eyes within earshot of Darwin tells the rest of the guys walking onto the court. No, fuck that guy. We are not running that play. <laughs> like um, the fact that like I reported that it goes viral the way that it does and received zero pushback from LeBron or his team at all, you know, and then on top of it, he goes on JJ Reddick's show and essentially repeats it. Right. And says like, yeah, this is what I do all the time. Um, uh, you know, he does not mess with Darvin Ham. This has been the case from like early on in the year that, you know, Darvin would, you know, try to, and, and I think Darvin understands that he needs LeBron on his side, like not just as, as far as like to have a working and operating uh, Lakers team, but also organizationally speaking, like if, if, if Darvin has a chance at remaining as the Lakers head coach, it would it would have to be because LeBron kind of vouched for him. Um, that would be another vo important voice to have. And I think he's made efforts to, you know, offer up that olive branch, you know, if if he possibly could to LeBron. And, and LeBron just keeps on like throwing it, like playing fetch with with whatever, you know, dog is out there. He gets the olive branch. He's like, all right, somebody go fetch this thing. I don't want it. And 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 um I I just don't see how you could realistically, we talked about the fan thing. We talked about, um, you know, reputation thing and all of that stuff. But I don't know how Rob Polinka sits down, sits across from LeBron in the meeting room and says, all right, so here's here's what we're going to do this year. Darwin is going to be back. And, and then LeBron just walks away. And I don't, you think that the Lakers would be willing to risk that with LeBron over Darwin Ham? I mean, I don't think they've shown a willingness to like heed to LeBron's desires since like the Anthony Davis trade, right? Um, because like you said, you know, LeBron is sort of the face attached to the Russell Westbrook deal, but like, Rob wanted to do it too, right? It allowed them to um, kind of uh, manipulate some salary in a way that worked out and uh, <clears throat> they got the big star, you know? Um, so like they didn't go after Kyrie Irving, or they didn't get Kyrie Irving, I should say, multiple times. Um, they didn't hire Ty Lu, right? Uh, I'm assuming Darvin Ham wasn't LeBron's number one choice as a coach when they did hire him. I I don't actually remember, but uh, it's not like handy. it's not like they've you know been in LeBron's pocket the whole time, which is kind of violates like the prime directive, right? <laughs> For being the Lakers, like you're supposed to adhere to the wishes of your star player and. They don't seem to love LeBron like that, um, which I realize I sound like Draymond Green talking to Paul Pierce. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I just don't think that pleasing LeBron is the number one, like, uh, Priority. marching order for, you know, the front office. So even if it, uh, you know, results in LeBron being dissatisfied, and, I mean, I don't see him opting out, right? Like, he's going to take that 50 million. He's not going to like go into the Philadelphia 76ers cap space this offseason, let's be real. So they'll get something out of the LeBron experience, whether that's a trade or <clears throat> whatever. He's not going to retire out of spite, I don't think. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm not saying I agree with any of this. I'm just saying that uh, yeah. I, I don't think that the fear of like dissatisfying LeBron is going to prevent them from doing something stupid. Yeah, I to me it's just it's it's just a 
a risk assess a risk assessment situation, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I don't think Darvin Ham, even given the financial stuff and all of this, right, and the human nature stuff, as we know, Rob Polinka is like his priority is to re remain employed, mm -hmm. like that he's he's going to do whatever it takes to remain employed, and if that means you know, being the meat shield when Jeannie Buss says that she's not willing to fire Darvin Ham and hire a new head coach, then that's what Rob Polink is going to do. And mm -hmm. if, um, if that means staring down LeBron after it, you know, and I'm not saying that this is definitely what Jeannie Buss would do. Um, but if Jeannie Buss does say that Darvin has to stay, that would be a conversation that Rob Polink would have to have with LeBron James. And I think he would have it because his top priority again is remaining employed. Um, but I, all that said to me, it like from, from the Lakers standpoint here, if this is even a conversation, if you're, if you're remotely concerned that LeBron could walk or ask to be moved, I, I think this hasn't, this is again, speculation, but I, I think, there's kind of a, a handshake deal between the Lakers and LeBron that he will never ask for a trade because of what you're talking about. Um, all of the times that they have just kind of, especially since the Russell Westbrook thing, all the times that they have just kind of said, now nah, we're going to go in this direction, right? LeBron may prefer this and the Lakers go in the other direction. I think that there's kind of a handshake deal there that he will never ask for a trade. Um, but, you know, that said, I... I don't see how he can like he knows how much work it took to be this prepared and this able at at this stage of his life. You know that I, I can't even fathom like it's hard for me to even think about mowing my lawn. And you know, I'm a year younger than LeBron's Lebron. got a few years on us, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and and uh you know for him to like stare down, you know, mortality again and stare down, you know, father time again. And and have to do all of that work all over again and know that the team that he plays on is still going to have this ceiling of Darvin Ham potentially sitting there to screw it all up, regardless of personnel. They could bring in Trey Young. They could bring in Donovan Mitchell. They could bring in, you know, whoever whoever it is. Macau Bridges is my preference, right? They could bring back Alex Caruso. Um, it, like, it doesn't matter what the roster looks like. I don't trust Darvin Ham to be able to get the most out of it. And when you have LeBron at that at this stage of his career, at this stage of his life, you do still need a coach who can optimize a roster because LeBron on his own is not good enough to overcome Nikola Jokic. He's not good enough to, to overcome, you know, Giannis in a series or, you know, Steph and Draymond and Klay Thompson and Steve Kerr when, you know, LeBron in, when it's LeBron and AD and a coach actively pulling in the opposite direction. You know, um, like I, I don't think LeBron is capable of doing all those things. And I think he thinks it too. I think he sees it too. He saw last year, the very end of that, that Denver Nuggets season or ser series, he played 47 minutes in like 35 seconds or whatever it was. And, and was talking about retirement after the fact. And I think like, I do, I, I never believed it for a second, but I do think it was an honest to God assessment of the situation. Like that is the most I can do. That is everything that I have in my basketball, you know, being to try to win one game against these MFers and we weren't able to do it. Right. Like, yeah. like, uh, and, and, and I, I do think that like, it, it's, it's perfectly human for him to look at that see how that plays out and be like, I, I can't do that again, especially mm -hmm. if that guy's still here. Like if I, <laughs> you know, and, and, um, you know, I, I, if I'm the Lakers, I'm not willing to risk it. If I'm the Lakers, I'm not willing to to sit there and say it's worth it to me to bring back. If he isn't the worst coach in the, in the league, he's the second worst coach, right? Like I think the only argument that people might offer, offer up is probably like Monty Williams this year was the only coach who was worse than, than uh, Darvin Ham. And I think I mean, there's some arguments for like Adrian Griffin, um, Brian Keefe, Washington, you know, Maybe uh, Keith had nothing to work with, and Griffin. I don't think Chauncey has done anything Rivers. to prove that he's a good coach. You know. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. I mean, I'm I'm not saying that like we need to decide who's thirtieth, but you know, yeah. <laughs> he's he's in the conversation. He's in the conversation. Yeah. 
this would be a very ESPN segment, right? Who's the worst coach in the NBA? <laughs> I don't have the energy for that. <laughs> <laughs> we need to bring uh, Mad Dog out so he can be like, mm -hmm. there's nobody worse than whoever coached the Lakers when they lost 11 straight championships to, the, <laughs> to my Celtics. Um, all right. Uh, let's move on, though. Uh, you know, before we get you out of here, I'd be remiss if we didn't talk about the women's tournament again. The athletic did incredible, had incredible coverage of of all of this, and and Sabrina was a big part of it. Um, I want to talk about. Uh, I don't want to do the whole discussion about the discussion thing. That's okay, <laughs> really boring to me. But um, Caitlin Clark and and like the announcement right after the tournament that the Indiana Fever are going to have what like thirty six. Uh, nationally 36 televised out of 40 games. national televised games. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All of them. They know at least some about. of national TV means like Amazon Prime Video, CBS Sports Network. So not like fully national games, but they are available beyond the Indiana market. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I, I understand some of the pushback in, in like in, in the Great White Hope things uh, aspect of this. Like that's, that's fine or whatever. Mm -hmm. But to me, um, watching her play, and watching like the basketball world's response to her playing, like there are very few athletes that like bring about that kind of sport wide or even sports wide, because like people outside of the basketball universe mm -hmm. where like you had, you had Mike Trout walk up to uh, one of his games wearing a, Clay a Caitlin Clark, uh, Iowa Jersey. Jalen you know, Hurts was at the game in Cleveland. I don't think yeah. he's from Cleveland, but he was there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and and like to me, um, you know, it's such a cool opportunity for for the sport of women's basketball. But I also think that like I think she carries the pressures of all of that remarkably well. Like rem she whines and she does all that stuff on the court. She talks her shit, which I love, by the way. But like <laughs> the fact that she like there's no way she doesn't feel this burden throughout that tournament. And there's no way she doesn't every time the ratings are, are tweeted out about like what her latest, what record she just broke or her, the game that she just played in just broke. Um, I, I think like beyond all of the nonsense that I saw off to the side while she was doing this, the part of this that blew me away was how well she carried being that kind of beacon of light for the sport. That was insane to watch how she handled all of that. Yeah, she wears the crown really well. And it's not like she's been primed for this for four years because like I covered the NCAA tournament last year. I was at her regional in Seattle, you know, so the Sweet 16 and Elite Eight games. And there were tons of empty seats in these crowds, like for her Sweet 16 and Elite Eight games as a junior. Like it only, I think it only really turned on a national audience when they beat South Carolina, like undefeated South Carolina in the final four last year, and then goes to the national title game. And obviously like that national title game delivered a big number, yeah. but it's not as if like she went into the Yukon factory and like knew this was coming from her freshman season. I mean, she played her first nine games of her college career. They were not available for anywhere other than like, I think there was some like big 10 streaming. Like there wasn't any fans because it was a COVID season, but like she, I'm not going to say she like, like jumped into this with like no preparation, but like, it's not like we could have seen all of this coming. Like it yeah, happened this wasn't LeBron pretty situation. quickly. Yeah. It happened. Like pretty LeBron, quickly. LeBron was a, a superstar in high school. He yeah, did like yeah. a national tour when he was in, in, you know, getting ready to go pro. Yeah. I mean, she was a top five recruit coming out of high school. I get that, but it's not like anyone could have predicted the massive stardom that would follow. And like you said, I mean, I think she's handled it so very well because, you know, obviously there's stories of her, like, signing all the jerseys for the fans and little girls who want to be just like her and she takes time for them and all that. But like just to perform at that level every day when you know, everybody is watching you, like, you know, they're down what, like five points in the final minute of the big 10 title game. And she leads Iowa to a comeback against Nebraska there. Um, you know, that really, really tough game against West Virginia in the second round at home when I feel like she definitely feels more pressure at home. It seems like, uh, they're just the energy of everyone in Iowa watching her seems to uh, be a little bit more to handle than like the way she played in Albany or in Cleveland later. But, you know, she, 
just delivers over and over again. Like, I don't think you watch the title game against South Carolina and think like, oh, they would have won if Caitlin Clark had been better. Like, no, no, South Carolina <laughs> was a better team. <laughs> yeah. They deserved better. to win that game. Yeah. And it, you know, it, but it exists in the same plane as Caitlin Clark, you know, being the light for everybody. Like you said, like you watch, you tune in to watch Caitlin Clark and you're exposed to everybody else. And I think that's pretty cool. Um, and she just, she understands like what this means for her. She's so perceptive about the history of women's basketball leading up to this point and that, you know, she knows she's not the only figure leading the charge, but she's happy to be the face of it. If that's what it means, yeah. you know, that's what she needs to do to get people into it. Right. Like she's not calling out people for not being on the women's basketball train for longer. Like she's accepting them for being here now and saying like, look at all of these other things you can see while you're here. Um, but yeah, I think the, I think the poise is really, really impressive. And um, just the fact that she has taken on this, this burden, right? Like Don Staley even mentioned it as she was accepting the trophy for the yeah. national title. Like, I just want to thank Caitlin Clark for everything she's done to lift our sport. The player you just defeated, the player who has gotten more attention than any of your players, your team yeah. probably as a whole. And you understand what she has done. I think to me, that was like the most revealing part of it that Don Staley even recognizes like, Hey, like we can have the discussion about like great white help or whatever, but at the, at the base of it, she's doing something for us that we're all benefiting from. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that's, this is funny because I obviously kind of disagree with, with the, the current pros who were saying like, Oh, she's going to learn when she gets here. Like she's not going to be ready for this. And like Gilbert arenas is showing his ass again, doing the whole, like, you know, and, and he, I wish he would just come out and say like, only black people should play my sport. Like, just to say it, Gilbert, just say it once. Just say like, cause we know that's what you're saying. Like that, just say it one time. But like he did, he, um, he did his thing. And then I think Diana, Diana Taurasi said, you know, said her piece as well. And she just said, um, she's gonna have to play against grown women versus 18 year olds. Like mm -hmm. it's different. And I think, like, yeah. You know, Cheryl swoops, right. Caught some heat for saying these things. And, mm -hmm. and I actually think like some of the immediate and, I think overly loud defense is kind of patronizing of Caitlin Clark because mm -hmm. she clearly doesn't need it. Like she she sees those quotes and she doesn't respond. I think she handles that really well too. Like she's, I, I think she can't wait to go out and play like go out. And, yeah, you're right. This is going to be a step up in competition. Cool. I want to see it. You know, I mean, that's and, why and, she's not using her COVID year, right? That's why she decided to leave Iowa where everything yeah. is laid out for her, right? Where she could make every record unbeatable until like the end of time for college basketball. Yeah. But yeah, like you said, she, she wants to step up to another level. She wants to take this challenge on. Yeah, I, I, I was really impressed. And by the way, like I was super impressed by like the women's game. And I thought on average, and it, anytime I tuned into a women's basketball game while the, the women's and men's tournament were going, so we're playing side by side. I was so much more impressed by the women's game than the men's game. The men's game is a mess, man. I, I can't. Other than I UConn. Can't. UConn is very cool. It, well, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But like, even there, like just like the, the, the relative lack of athleticism that I, I just like keep seeing in that sport. It's just like, it's really kind of, it's, I, I don't remember it being this bad when I was a kid. I don't know what happened. I don't know if it's the one and done thing. I have no idea. But when I was when I was growing up, I don't remember the the you know. I'm sorry, like back in my day, like I, I promise it, like it wasn't this bad. I, I feel like I don't remember it being this ugly. But um, but yeah, the, the women's sport in general and the women's tournament in general, like I don't know how many different times we're gonna see, you know, game Caitlin Clark plays in does this record number. I don't know how many times we're going to have to see that before we finally acknowledge like this is this is going to like, you know, the women's uh, basketball, especially if the uh, WNBA ever gets their stuff together. Right. I saw their commissioner rights talking about how they're hoping to double their rights fees. Like, please set your set your we don't need to little... come into the negotiations with that. Yeah. <laughs> like... <laughs> Like that can't be where you started. Like yeah. you're announcing like, <laughs> um, but anyway, I, I, I was just, I, I, you know, I don't know what, what do you think it would take though? Um, for kind of waves generally at everybody to recognize, no, this is real. Like this is, this is not going anywhere. It's going to continue, Maybe not its exponential growth. Might be. I don't know. But 
like it's going to continue growing in popularity. It's this very cool thing. I think the women in general are incredibly marketable. They're like, there is few things. I coached women's basketball uh, when I came out of uh, high school. And I'm telling you, it was the most fun I've had in the sport because the girls that I coached were just so much fun to be around. They just seemed so much more um, like approachable and relatable than the guys that even in the NBA, right? You have these zillionaire superstars in the NBA. And I actually think that like, I, I, I would rather spend time with the, the, the women who were playing this game because they just seem so much more down to earth and so much more relatable in all these things. This thing is going to keep growing. Um, at what point do you, or do you think it is being taken seriously in the way that it should be? Yeah, I think NIL has been so huge for women's athletes because they just understand social media in a way that men don't and are able to market themselves uh, just better than men have, Absolutely. I think. I mean, like, you look at these national commercials. Maybe I just don't recognize them, but, like, I see Caitlin Clark and Juju Watkins in national commercials. I don't see Donovan Klingon or Zach Eady or, you know, it's not, it's not on the same level. And, I mean, I think we're at a really interesting point here where, like you said, the women are more relatable, and, like, maybe that's – almost part of the problem, like NBA players seem out of touch because they're gazillionaires, right? Like the amount of yeah. money they make is incomprehensible. Yeah. And the goal of, you know, any sports league is for women to get to that point where they get to be gazillionaires. And do they become unrelatable at that point? Like, I don't know, but we're at this point now where the salaries that WNBA players make don't seem out of touch for somebody who's just a normal person turning on the television, right? Like you're not, um, you're not offended by the fact that like, Nafisa Collier has to sit out a game because, oh yeah, she only makes 200 K a year. Like it's okay if she needs to rest for a game. Like I understand. Right. Um, but uh, I, I, I sort of lost track of where I was going, but I think the the key for college is going to be that they carry this momentum without Caitlin. Like I think they've tried really hard to shine a light on Paige Beckers, on Juju Watkins, on, you know, Flage Johnson and all of these other people who will be stars next year that can carry that momentum forward. I don't think we're going to expect to see the same, you know, ratings figures that we did last year but as long as you can build off of like the 2023 numbers that should be fine right like we just need to see a general yeah. positive growth in that direction and i think you know just it's a matter of espn investing and in like showing these games like there was there was like actual pre-game coverage for all of these things and post-game coverage and like yeah. uh, i remember like the scott van pelt show after the iowa yukon final four was the highest rated scott van pelt show ever and the pre-game you know for the national title game did better numbers than any national title game, like pre 2023, which is like the pregame did better than the game. Like there's, there's yeah. a real interest in these, these players, these athletes. And I think that there are enough stories that they can capitalize on that. It doesn't just have to be Caitlin. I, I think like the real question is what does the WNBA do about it? Because I don't worry about the future of the college game. I think with, you know, the fact that players have to stay three to four years and yeah, there is real investment Such at the grassroots advantage. level. Yeah, it's exactly. An advantage. Yeah. There's real investment at the grassroots level in like training these players and making them more prepared when they get to college. Like you're seeing an absolute just growth in how good the game is, right? Like just the talent level, the skill level is so much better than it was 10 years ago. So I think college is in a good place because it has the ESPN infrastructure, right? Like they're going to be on your TV. You're, you're going to have that March Madness 10 poll to look forward to. Um, even if it's not Caitlin, I think there are enough stars that people will gravitate towards. Like I think Juju's going to obviously take a big step forward now that there's no Caitlin. Um, but it's really, what does the WNBA do now that they do have Caitlin, right? And yeah, maybe it's ridiculous that the Indiana Fever, who finished 10th in the WNBA out of 12 teams last year, have 36 games on national television out of 40. 90% of their games are on national television. Yeah. Maybe it's ridiculous, but I don't think so. I think this is a league that has consistently been criticized for not marketing its stars. And like, does the average basketball fan, could they pick Asia Wilson out of a lineup, even though she's the very best basketball player in the world? I'm not sure. Yeah. I'm not sure that the average fan who just follows the NBA could do that. So yeah, if you're going to overkill on Caitlin, that's fine because we saw what happened in college when they overkilled on Caitlin. You found other people to follow in the interim, right? Yeah. So if this is your opportunity, this is your opportunity as a WNBA, like we have the golden goose right in front of us. So let's just, you know, pick up as many of those eggs as possible because you just don't know if this opportunity is going to come along again, right? She is at this perfect inflection of, you know, with NIL, with her star being as high as possible with people like actually expressing interest in women's sports, whether that's because of volleyball or soccer or anything else that has drawn their attention towards this particular space in an Olympic year, right? If she makes team USA, that makes her even bigger of a draw, you know, for this potential sport. Um, I just think that like, 
this is this is kind of like the moment, right? Like we're going to figure out if the WNBA has the guts, not the guts, but like the the wherewithal to get this done if they capitalize on Caitlin. Like I'm not worried about college. I think that has been on a good trajectory for a little while now. Um, it's really the W because there are so many really, really great players in W who I think are very marketable as is. I think I, I think that I think their response to Caitlin is perfectly natural, by the way. Yeah. But like, come on, come like can we can we see this first before we anoint her? Yeah. And I'm like, fine with that. What, like I like people are like telling like, me like you don't that that's that's wrong, they're jealous of this, they're petty. It's like, yeah, they're yeah, athletes. And they'll- and when they see her in person and they accept that she's great, they'll accept that she's great if she is. You cool. know, like just how NBA players, like when they saw Wimby for the first time, they're like, oh, okay. Like there's yeah. something here, right? They're not going to be for the sake of being petty. I think we've seen that on the men's side, right? Like if somebody generational comes through, they'll accept that. Um, but yeah, I think rivalries, hating, as long as it's not like, you know, racially motivated, is totally fine. Um, and I think that this is this is the go time for the WNBA, right? Like, if you really want to prove that you can have a standing, like in that summer sports landscape, if you're trying to expand, like create a bigger footprint around the country, you got to make it happen now because you're never going to get an opportunity like this again. I don't think it's coming, at least not for another generation or so. And she's going to be playing in the W right away, right? Like, yeah, the season starts gets, in May. She gets drafted. Yeah. Like she gets this drafted month. on Monday. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then training camp starts on April 28th and the season yeah. starts in May. So yeah, that, they'll have the that, opportunity to just keep Caitlin coverage going on and on and on. Like when she lands in Indiana, right? Like when she first suits up for training camp, they could keep this going like pretty much daily up until the season starts. And then you have the games over and over again. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, you know, I think that's, I, I don't think it was done on purpose. I think it's a scheduling thing, but like it works out really well for the WNBA, it, you know, and, and it's really wise of them to, you know, yeah, I understand that there is going to be pushback, but you know what the pushback means? It means that you, you have somebody feeling a certain way about this thing. And like the, the only thing that you, you can't have if you're the WNBA is to kind of suppress her into apathy and general, the, the general apathy that can exist with the w and then it's mm-hmm. been trying to fight so if you do overkill it if you do push her in in those 36 games of the 40 that they're going to play and put them on these unique uh platforms that they wouldn't otherwise have been yeah you're, you're going to piss some people off but you're making them feeling a certain way like exactly. that, that's a good thing you want yes. that and yeah. and you know obviously i think more people are going to be happy about the fact that we're going to see her as often as we are in on that on that stage and against those players, because like you're, you're saying you're absolutely correct, Sabrina, the, 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 the sport in the WNBA is legitimately great. You know, I also think that like WNBA fans need to stop gatekeeping personally, but like, I, 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 you know, but it's, it's got, it's in that like kind of cool spot that like indie bands tend to be in yeah. right before they take off. Right. Where the current fans are like, no, 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 don't get bigger. Like I, we're good. Don't let the idiots in because like, and then we started seeing as the sport keeps getting bigger that like the 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 first take shows and the morning sports shows come on and you have NFL players saying all kinds of stupid stuff about a sport that they'd never watched before. But that's good too. Yeah. Like those those the, it's it's dumb. It's dumb that it is good for you. But again, it's 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 forcing these people who get casual fans to feel a certain way about a sport and 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 that's an emotion that didn't exist before. So I like I think all of this is a positive wave and i'm 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 really curious i think it's going to work out I, I i do think that the wnba um has the infrastructure in terms of current stardom that you know if caitlin clark uh does struggle it'll be on a stage where people start seeing like wow i thought you know she was really good in college who is this player that is playing better than her in this game that's going to happen mm-hmm. um and and I think that'll be good for the sport. And then also, if she plays well enough to like keep this momentum going, then you're in, then you're then it's like the the money's just like it, it's going to start printing itself. So I, I I'm really fascinated by how this is going to go. And and and, and uh, congratulations, by the way, on insane <sighs> coverage. It was it, it was it was really fun to watch you kind of come into your own on 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 doing this as well. Yeah, I mean, I didn't expect when I made the move to covering women's basketball. Like I obviously thought it was a growth opportunity, you know. Uh, just where the sport was and I'm obviously passionate about the sport itself but like I didn't think we'd already exceed like people that were reading my NBA stuff on women's basketball stuff we're we're at that point like a year and a half in and it's it's pretty cool 
That's dope. That is really, really cool. All right. Before we, you can stick around if you want, Sabrina, but we do have some uh, super comments that I have to Oh, I got to hear the, the noise for the super comments. So yeah. It's, we'll it's important. In. It's yeah. important. Yeah. Um, all right. So we have the first one here from uh, Legend, which means... Oh, it's so pretty. Legend writes, uh, why did Jay Suggs uh, trade not happen? He's elite now. Jalen Suggs, I'm guessing, and I don't know. If, yeah, yeah, I don't know if if uh, if a Jalen Suggs trade was ever on the table. Um, if it was and it didn't happen, it's because the Lakers would have had to move D'Angelo Russell or Austin Reeves. And if the Lakers weren't willing to move Reeves for Suggs or for for um, Murray, Murray, who is better than Suggs, then that kind of tracks. And if uh, you know we saw the league not really be interested in trading for a D'Angelo Russell with a player option on his contract, then that's going to hurt that trade anyway. So you could, you could put, you know, why did underlying trade not happen, here? Yeah. yeah, not happen. And those are, those are the general two uh, reasons there. I, I wish I liked Suggs game more. Like I, I, <laughs> it's because you're a UCLA fan and you have the memory of him hitting that shot against UCLA in the final four. That's what it is. Actually, now I don't wish I liked this game more. <laughs> uh, all right, we have another one here, uh, which I think makes it an interesting, interesting. Um, all right, so Darvin, this is from Showtime Lakers Baby saying, Darvin seems like a college coach, but I don't think he's built for the league. Uh, who do we want to go get? Don't say Phil, uh, either Jackson or Handy. Um, well, look, Handy was LeBron's preference the first time around when they hired um, Darvin Darvin, yeah. And uh, that is going to, if if uh, Ty Lue isn't available, Handy is once again going to be LeBron James's preference here. And I don't know. Personally, I think it would be good to get back on the same page as LeBron with the organization. I, 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 Handy might not be the best option. Um, Handy, I, I think if you do hire Handy, that you you need to kind of fill out the rest of your staff with uh, you know player coaches that help him in 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 other areas that he he might be deficient in. That was I think a mistake that they made with him. I thought mm -hmm. that and even there's Logan, no one with head coaching experience on his staff. Yeah, so mm -hmm. I think that you would need to go out and do that. There is. Do you have a preference here if the if the Lakers do fire him? Um. Why, why can't we get like a, you know, a Thunder, one of their G League guys? Like who's running the Thunderbody? Oklahoma City Blue these days? <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, I know. I know a lot of those guys. Um, and this isn't me like crapping on on this contingent of Lakers coverage. Right. But I know like Sean Davis and uh, Tim from from uh, the Lakers exceptionalism pod. They always have their like list of X's and O's coaches that mm -hmm. that like would would step in and be really good. I think the impact of an X's and O's coach would be kind of um, nullified by the way that LeBron prefers to play. And I would just rather get a guy that LeBron I know is going to buy into um, yeah. and then try to make it up, make up for it with like, I actually think, I think it was poorly executed. I think Chris Gent, uh, I think got a little carried away this year with like the extent of the five out stuff and, and just like generally speaking, the personnel decisions that were made for the five out um, system. Um, but that idea, right. Bringing in somebody who was capable of those things to help handy with the X's and O's or to help with the, like, I, I loved the, the, um, I remember Mike Brown's old staff when he was the Lakers it was coach, the most unbelievable staff ever assembled, right? Quinn <laughs> Snyder, Ettore Messina. Yeah. Um, I think Darwin was actually on that staff, wasn't he? Or wait, no, it was, um, no hang on let me pull um, up uh no it was the guy uh, steve clifford i think was on that staff yeah um and and yeah like it's a whole bunch of like future head coaches that uh that were on that staff and i think either future or past too if i remember correctly oh yeah darvin um, was on that staff um yeah that's crazy yeah. wow full circle they aged pretty well you know <laughs> I, I take it back that staff sucked <laughs> um now they think about it. <laughs> they've all gone to great places you know <laughs> yeah um, all right, we have one more, which means we, we get to hear this one more time. Dan Tony was there the next year, too. Have fun. Yeah. Uh, Rye Guy writes, uh, back to the viral Braun slash Ham video from the Golden State game. Over 5 million views between IG and Twitter alone in two days. 
Uh, imagine it's gotten back to the players slash the team. has. Seen. They see all of this. Like that is one of the first things that you learn in doing this stuff is how attuned to um, our content that they are. Like I remember, um, I remember finding out this was really early in my career, but I remember finding out that uh, when I was writing at Silver Screen, John Black, the old head of PR, mm -hmm. would have people print out our articles so that he could read them, which is so perfectly on brand for John Black. Like he was so behind the times that he didn't like have a computer or a phone that he would just like read the stuff on. He would get it printed out. Um, so they are very aware of all of their coverage as they should be. If you have a, a PR staff worth its weight in lead, uh, that is their job is to, to make sure that they are aware of all of those things. They are never surprised by these things going viral. Um, the thing that has really surprised me and stuck out, and I've pointed this out over the course of the season, um, is how little pushback there has been to any of the noise about Darwin. <laughs> like, instead, you had D'Angelo Russell actually go out there and second a lot of the the opinions and reporting on Darwin. Um, that's another reason that I just I just don't I can't fathom this guy being back, given how little respect the the locker room doesn't seem to have for him, but clearly has for him. Like it's it's wild how how little how few people came to I remember that the Lakers played against Memphis either Memphis or Toronto um and their coach lost their mind over a call like lot mm -hmm. actually Probably Toronto no because it was it was um it was a situation where the coach like went onto the court and was almost almost made contact with a player I think you like made contact with Prince I think it was Jenkins from uh Memphis and some That's of the right. guys um from memphis were like asked about it and they were all like no man like that guy jenkins is our guy we are you know we stand behind him 100 percent, right this is in you know, they really kind of circled the wagons around their head coach and i can just imagine like if if players i we've heard it right um you know ha getting a player get asked about darvin hammond and it's like how do you feel about this guy and it's like oh he's trying <laughs> <laughs> yeah um, all right i have taken up way too much of your time sabrina i greatly appreciate you stopping by um to talk about all of these things with me i am really sad to hear that you ignored or you weren't able to watch the like good three weeks of lakers the basketball this season. Renaissance. yeah don't worry <laughs> like, follow harrison that's, on twitter that's i'm aware <laughs> really unfortunate um timing um on, on i'll always part. have the ist anthony don't worry <laughs> <laughs> Do you have your t-shirt? Like, um, but yeah, I, uh, before we get you out of here, is there anything that you want to plug anything that uh, I want to get out of your way and make sure you guide everybody to, again, I'm telling you guys, I subscribe to the athletic because of Sabrina back when she started there. I'm not kidding. That is an actual fact. Yeah. So the WME draft coming up on Monday, we'll have a lot of stuff leading up to it. Um, I've got <laughs> some more stuff on Gail Clark actually coming up before then. Uh, and what do you then think's going first. Yeah, I'll <laughs> read my mock draft to find out. Um, and then after the draft, obviously, lots of coverage, you know, based on team specific needs. We'll have a little bit of a lull for the next two weeks because, yes, I have been working quite hard over the last three weeks during the tournament. Uh, forgive me. But, you know, once WNB training camps start up, like this is the place you're going to want to find like all of your analysis about the teams and the rookie class and what we can expect coming into this season. And the athletic women's basketball show is my opinion the podcast to listen to to keep up with your women's basketball news it's all excellent i i i've always believed in sabrina right from from day one at silver screen and roll i always thought that you were going to be doing some really cool things and then to watch that actually come to fruition with your coverage of women's basketball has been really really fun so uh, thank you a ton for hopping on here. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Please do hit that subscribe button if you're watching here on YouTube. If you're watching, uh, if you're one of the 800 people who are watching on Twitter right now, please do hit that. Head on over to youtube.com slash at Lakers Lounge, and you can subscribe to the show there. Uh, if you are listening to this tomorrow morning via podcast, uh, please do subscribe wherever you get your podcasts, preferably on Odyssey. So until the next time you guys hear from me, I'm Anthony Irwin. Tomorrow will be Aaron Larsoul. Today was uh, Sabrina Merchant. Have a great rest of your day. Make somebody else's, and we'll talk to you tomorrow.